Well, I, uh, again, want to welcome you all here. This is, uh, I guess, this is sort of our first formal uh, evening. I'm going to start with one cute story, and then I'm going to start with a more profound thing. This is uh, it kind of getting at why are we here? What are we doing here? Why are, why are we here at all? And the answer is we felt compelled. Like the, the, the Lord is saying, get together, my people, and turn in prayer because people are hungry. Catholics are hungry. We want to go deeper. We want to go deeper into our faith. Cute story. It is just cute, okay? It's not profound. It's just cute. Uh, something I've learned or heard along the way. Uh, story is, uh, you know, here's a, a mom comes in and, and sees one of her kids vacuuming the living room. The, the rug is all dirty, right? And it's like, first of all, that's a miracle. And uh, this teenager... And the mom is watching and, and saying, what are you doing? Says, I'm doing my job. I'm, I'm vacuuming the, the carpet. And she says, but you're just moving dirt around. Says, well, I've got it turned on. Yeah, but it's not plugged in. <laughs> okay, I told you, it, was just, it wasn't profound. It was just cute. All right? And uh, I'm not claiming it as my story. But it, it actually is quite a poignant story. A lot of Catholics doing Catholic stuff. But all they're doing is moving dirt around. And they're wondering why their lives aren't getting cleaned up. They're wondering why things aren't getting better. And the answer is, they're not plugged in. They're not plugged into the source of power that the Lord has given to the church. The source of power that the Lord has given to the church to be able to clean up the dirt, to be able to actually transform our whole lives. That's the Holy Spirit. So all the talks that I'll be giving, these sort of short little teachings, are all geared towards us growing in the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. But for some reason, we haven't been plugged in and we haven't turned on the power. So we're going to learn all about the theology of plugging in and turning on the power of God that the Lord wants for us as a church because we won't be victorious over the messes in our lives if we're not accessing the power that God has for us. Okay, something a little more profound now. We're going to go all the way back to St. Bonaventure. He is the seventh minister general of the Franciscan order. So after St. Francis, 13th century. And he um, uh, wrote to the superior... Uh, the superiors of the different um, Franciscan communities, the friaries around the, the world at the time. And he wrote a, a book to guide them in forming faith in their communities. It's called The Six-Winged Seraph, if you're interested in looking it up. In it, he talks about three enemies of spiritual growth. Right, Not the world, the flesh, and the devil, but I want you to hear these three enemies of spiritual growth, and then you're going to share among yourselves. Which of those three enemies struck you the most as being relevant for today? Okay? So we're going to learn from a doctor of the church, St. Bonaventure, as well as from a recent saint, St. John Paul II, who identified as well these three enemies of spiritual growth. Okay? The way that Bonaventure describes them is the following. He calls them diversion, distraction, and dispersion. Diversion, distraction, and dispersion. John Paul II picks it up in a document on the preparation for the church entering the third millennium. Okay? Tertio millennium adveniente. In it, he talks about these three enemies that would stop the church or hold the church back from accessing the grace of jubilee that the Lord was offering the church. And he called them infidelity, inconsistency, and slowness to act. Ooh, these are powerful. So let's take a look at those three, and then I'm going to have you share with two people, two other people, so little groups of three of you, about which of those three is like striking home the most for you. So remember now, Bonaventure, diversion, distraction, dispersion. Diversion is what John Paul II called infidelity. So diversion are the ways in which we are stopped from growth in the spiritual life through the temptation to sin, through the actual giving in to sin in our lives. So when we think about what's holding us back, well, we're stuck in sin. 
or we're facing harassing, oppressive, obsessive temptations that we give into, and that obviously holds us back. So we can think about the ways in which we as a church or we individuals are held back from spiritual growth through diversion. Second is, what was the second one? You were distracted and you didn't remember. You're taking notes on it. Now Anne's just flexing. She's sitting closest to the front and taking notes. This is good. She's focused, which is the opposite of distracted. So distraction isn't so much like the direct temptation to sin. It's you get up in the morning and something inside of you says, I should pray. And then you're like, no, wait a minute. I need to make the list of things I'm doing today. Or there's this really interesting news item that I need to watch and follow on, on, uh, on my phone. Or maybe just anything else that says, let me get distracted from what I ought to be doing. So it's those time wasters, those time sinks that just rob us of spiritual growth. John Paul II calls that inconsistency. So infidelity is the diversion that will take us away from God. When we are distracted, we are inconsistent. I want to do these things, but I'm just not doing them. Now, what's the third one? Diversion, distraction, and dispersion. Now, dispersion isn't so much a time waster. It's when I want to do this good thing. Let me start doing that. Let me do this other good thing. Let me do this other good thing. And then all of a sudden, the many, many good things rob us from doing the one thing that God wants us to do. I'm called to do this, but instead I'm so dispersed that I end up losing the focus and attention and energy I need to do the good thing that God wants me to do. Ooh, we're so dispersed that our energy is all spread out. John Paul II calls that slowness to act. Whoa, which is a surprise because you'd think, well, no, this person's so busy that they're doing many things. No, no, no. What's happened is you don't have the, ever, I don't have the energy to pray tonight. Or I want to get to that person, but I can't because I'm so busy with the other good thing. Bonaventure and John Paul identify these things as enemies of spiritual growth. Okay, diversion, distraction, dispersion, infidelity, inconsistency, slowness to act. Think about that and just share, you know what, of these three, this one really struck me, okay? And then we'll come back. Okay, great. So continuing on, um, do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? Ooh, what an interesting question. Do you have a personal, not with Jesus, do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? 1984. Someone asked me that question, okay? What was the context? Well, I was in the seminary, so studying to be a priest, first year, and I got connected with a contemplative nun. She was living a cloistered life. The community was a cloister for those whose mission was to undergo disabling suffering for the fruitful good of the church. Who wants to join that community, <laughs> right? In order to get in, you had to have a disabling suffering and live a cloistered life of prayer and undergoing the trial and the pain of your condition to offer that up for the redemption of the world. Wow. That's the kind of person you want to be connected with. Her name was Sister B, and I got connected to her through another seminarian. And Sister B said, I'm going to pray for you, Tom. And she wrote me this little note. And her disabling suffering was rheumatoid arthritis that was so severe from a childhood that they had to take the bones out of her fingers because her suffering was so great. They had to fuse her spine. And it, the, the degree of suffering that she was intense. So she wrote me this little note and said, Tom, as you enter this journey towards the priesthood, discerning this, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would make you like the burning bush. The Holy Spirit would make you fire. Because the burning bush 
displayed the Shekinah glory of God. That's the Hebrew word, Shekinah, the, the glory of God that consumes without destroying. Now that's a fire, a divine fire that consumes without destroying. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit makes you fire. And as you study and learn all about the truth of God, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit makes you like a sponge that becomes so filled with the life-giving water of the Holy Spirit that it comes pouring out of you. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit makes you a fire and a sponge. And I read that letter and I'm like, whoa, whoa. So um, a couple weeks later, um, they announced that they were having confession that night at the seminary. And I happened to see the priest that came in from the outside that they were bringing in to hear confessions. And I, and I saw him and immediately knew he was the priest for me. He was blind. I said, perfect. I want to go. <laughs> this is the priest I want to have hear my confession. So went in. I could pour it all out, right? I went in, made my confession. And at the end, he said, before I forgive you, he said, I have a question for you. Do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? In the confessional. Do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? Now, at this point, I was a clever young man studying theology. So I thought, let me start talking. So I started talking about Jesus and I have a relationship with Jesus. Because that's what most people think about. And I did. I had a personal relationship with Jesus. He said, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit. And I'm like, uh-oh. And then I started talking about the Trinity, you know, Father, Son. And he said, stop. He said, no, no, stop. He said, the Holy Spirit. Do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? You do believe in the Holy Spirit, don't you? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, the Holy Spirit wants to have a personal relationship with you. And I'm going to give you two images for what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. He said, the first is fire. Oh, wow. The Holy Spirit wants to make you fire. Now, thank God he was blind, because I went, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. And so I'm like, all right. And he says, I want to give you one more image. I want you to imagine a faucet of water, and then I want you to imagine a sponge <laughs> being put under the faucet. The water gets turned on, and this dry sponge gets so full of water that it then absorbs, expands, and then water comes out of the bottom of it. He said, the Holy Spirit wants to make you a sponge. And I said to him, do you know a nun named Sister B? <laughs> no, he did not. But they know the same God, who's our loving Father. And that loving God wants for us to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. So what we are going to be focused on, and what I'm going to encourage you to do, is what that priest encouraged me to do back in 1984. He said, every time you go to communion, as you're approaching the reception of Jesus, pray the Come Holy Spirit prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. And he said, pray that as you receive Jesus, that he would give you a more personal relationship with the Holy Spirit and make you a fire and a sponge. I started doing that in 1984, and I've never stopped. And so I'm going to encourage you in these weeks to come every day, Holy Spirit, I want a more personal relationship with you. Make me a fire, like the burning bush. And you know what, by the way, that's theologically correct. One of the ways that the Catholic Church describes Mary is the burning bush of the definitive theophany. There you go. There's some theology for you. Mary is the burning bush of the definitive theophany. The theophany means the manifestation of God. But what's the definitive manifestation of God? Jesus. And so the definitive uh, that she's the burning bush of the definitive theophany is that she is literally the one through whom God's glory shines because she was consumed by the fire of God, the Holy Spirit, who was her spouse, 
Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And one of the beautiful principles at work in church theology, in the theology of the Catholic Church, is what applies to Mary directly applies to us by analogy. What applies to Mary directly applies to us by analogy, which means Mary gave birth to the word, the word to the world, right? She said yes, and her yes allowed the word to be born in her physically, and she gave birth to the word in the world. Guess what happens when you say yes? You, in your own way, allow the word to come to birth in you, and the word of God shines forth through you into your world. That's the analogy. And so if Mary is the burning bush of the definitive theophany, we can be a burning bush of the definitive theophany. Okay? So pray that you become like the burning bush and that you'd shine forth with the glory of God. That's the Holy Spirit who wants to be a source of renewal in our lives and in the church today, okay? Now, let's take a look at that idea of source of renewal. This brings me to John Paul II. St. John Paul II was a bishop at the Second Vatican Council. Did you know that? He was the Archbishop of Krakow, sent to the Vatican Council, 62 to 65, participated in all these sessions. All these 16 documents were released. He goes back to Krakow and says, we have to take these documents, we've got to enflush them in the diocese. We've got to take all of these beautiful teachings, we've got to make them alive to be a source of renewal in the church in Krakow. And so he wrote a book called Sources of Renewal on the implementation of the Second Vatican Council. Ta-da! Now the key to this whole book is the first chapter. In the first chapter, he describes the foundation for what it takes to have a source of renewal come from the church's teaching. And what he says is this. He says that when we think about bringing a renewal to our lives, having renewal happen in our lives, we think about doing stuff. Let's go do these things. And he said actions are important. But he said more important than actions are attitudes. Because actions display Attitudes. Did you know that? Do you have a teenager? <laughs> Actions display attitudes, right? They're not just neutral. So actions are what you're doing. Attitudes are how you are relating to what you're doing. So attitudes are more fundamental than actions. But he said even more fundamental than attitudes is awareness, or what he says is consciousness, or how you see something. Because guess what shapes your attitude? Guess what shapes how you relate to something? How you see it. How I see something shapes how I relate to it, and that manifests itself in my behavior. Awareness, attitudes, actions. Awareness, how I see, shapes how I relate, my attitude, and that manifests itself in how I behave. Source, if we're going to be a source of renewal in the church today, should we focus on transforming our awareness, our attitudes, or our actions? Yes. Yeah. It's all of the three, all of the above. But John Paul II makes a big point in Sources of Renewal that if we're going to experience real renewal in the church, it can't start and simply focus on what we're doing. That is not going to go deep enough. It's not going to go deep enough. Okay, I'm going to give you an application to this. Okay? And the application has to do with the idea of overcoming sin. Okay? What's another way of describing sin? It's when we settle for less. It's when we betray a relationship with the Lord. It's when we fall short of God's glory. It's, yes, breaking God's law, but it's breaking God's heart. When we want to overcome sin, John Paul II says awareness, attitude, and action. There are three levels of experience conversion from sin. What are these three levels? Well, let's start at the level of action. When you think about, I've committed a sin, think about a misdeed that you've done, thought, word, or deed. What is conversion looking like? Repentance. God, I am so sorry. So when it comes to conversion at that level of action, it's when we learn how to repent. Lord, please forgive me. I am so sorry. I repent of that deed. Okay, that's great. We got that. We all understand that. What about attitudes? When it comes to attitudes, an attitude is something that's more like the atmosphere that you carry about with you. So you're not really repenting of 
something that is just how you're relating to something. So how you relate isn't requiring repentance, but rather what the church says is you're asked to renounce. Renunciation. I renounce this entire way of relating to money. I renounce how I'm relating to time. I renounce how I've related to you. So you think about it, and it's like, I don't always commit the misdeed of speaking badly to my kids. But that can be traced back to an attitude, how I'm relating to them. So if I can renounce the attitude, guess what can also break up? The actions. So remember, actions are traced back to attitudes. So the power of renunciation, renouncing something, is it can sever a connection. And so that's that second level. And the, the most profound level is what? Awareness. So awareness, how does that relate to conversion? Well, if you look at the scriptures in the New Testament, the deepest level of conversion is called metanoia. And metanoia is a Greek word that means change of mindset. Oh, what's another word for change of mindset? Changing how I see something, how something lives in my mind. Well, how do I get a change of mindset? Well, if I can come to conversion in my actions through, what was that action called? Repentance, I'm sorry. If I get to a change of attitude through, what's that called? Renunciation, I renounce this. How do I get to the conversion of my mindset? You cry out to God and say, help! Help! It's a grace from God. Lord, I don't know how to stop seeing myself with self-hatred. I don't know how to stop seeing this person in the light of all the things that have happened here. Lord, I am powerless. I need the grace of a changed mindset. And so if we're going to experience true renewal, true conversion, it's going to involve repentance of deeds, renouncing attitudes, and crying out to God for a metanoia, a changed mindset. I'll pause there. Get you guys back in the groups again and think about or share on those three types of conversions, conversion of deeds through repentance, conversion of attitudes through renunciation, and conversion of mindset through crying out to Christ, transform my mind. Which of the three do you think we need to most to hear about today? Which of the three or struck you the most when you heard about them right now, okay? Great. So I'm just gonna dig in briefly into this idea of, what is this idea of a call from God? Now, we've all been around the block enough to know that we're not here by accident. But let's dig a little bit further into the church's understanding of call. And I'm gonna focus it in on the reality of a relationship with the Lord. If I say to you, you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, well, we, we're called upon to have personal relationships with each of the persons of the Trinity. But what describes the nature of these relationships? Four words. A personal relationship with, the, with a person of the Trinity is to be intimate, personal, profound, and vital. Intimate. It's a call into nearness. It's a call into intimacy. Second is it's personal, where you know that it's the person of the Father, and you know that the person of the Father knows you. It's profound. You don't come to a dead end and feel like there's no more. No, there's, there's a sense of the infinite. There's a greatness, there's a bigness in the relationship. And lastly, you know that you're in a personal relationship with God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when it's life-giving. It's vital. It makes your life alive. And so we're gonna just explore that briefly by talking about the three persons of the Trinity in relationship to just how close God wants to be to you in your life. How much God wants you to know his love for your life. The first is the person of the Father. And that's the foundation of all other relationships that we have, is your first insight, the first idea that you should have that you're called is that you're here. It's literally the call into existence. The fact that you are 
is not an accident. It's his design. It's his call. The call into existence says this, that to be is to be addressed by God in love. Just to be, literally, just to exist, is to be someone who's addressed by God in love. Catechism of the Catholic Church, read it, paragraph one, easy to remember, paragraph one, says that in every time and in every place, God draws close to you. Not sometimes, some places, God might consider drawing close to the crowd. No. In every time, in every place, God draws close to you. It's personal. It's that personal. So God the Father, how does God the Father, tradition in our theological tradition, come close to you? Through what he's created. Look at the beauty of creation. And the artist shows up through his art, in his art. So literally, you can't escape the encompassing love of the Father, who is always calling out to you in love at every moment. If you haven't known the love of the Father in a way that is what? Intimate, personal, profound, and life-giving, pray for that gift. Pray that you know the love of the Father who is drawn close to you through all that he has created. What about the Son? The Son is Emmanuel. God is with us. So not only in the dimension of space, but in the dimension of time. What did Jesus say at the end of the Gospel of Matthew? Go and preach the Gospel of all nations, baptize them and teach them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you occasionally. <laughs> That's not your translation. I will be with you yes. always, at all times. At all times, Jesus is breaking in. Now's the time. Now's the day of salvation. There is no moment in your life that is abstracted from, separated from, the nearness of Christ. Jesus says, I am with you. I'm with you always. And so he is drawing close to you in the dimension of the unfolding of events in your life. In, in what sort of way? In a way that is intimate, personal, profound, and life-giving. If you struggle to have that sense of an intimate, personal, profound, life-giving relationship with Jesus, I encourage you to go in front of the tabernacle. Why? There's a concretization of the very glorified presence of Jesus. And there, in front of the tabernacle, or in an adoration chapel where Jesus is exposed in front of the monstrance, read Revelation chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 1, John has an encounter with the risen, glorified Lord. When you read what Jesus, his encounter with Jesus was like in Revelation 1, his face shone at the sun at the brightest, and his hair was snow-white wool, and his voice sounded like the mighty, uh, flowing of mighty waters. And when he turned and looked at him, what happened to John? He fell down as though dead. He is perfect holiness and perfect life. And in the face of perfect holiness and perfect life, it says, if my life is drained, I who have fallen short. That's the Jesus that is present in the Blessed Sacrament. Read that passage, the word of God, and say, Jesus, this is you here? Show me. Show me, Jesus. I want to have the encounter with you, Jesus, the Revelation 1 encounter. I want to have that encounter with you, Jesus, right here. Please, I'm not leaving. I long for that encounter. I need that encounter. I'm desperate. I want to know you in a more intimate. I want to have that sense of nearness. A more personal. I want to know that you know me. And I want to know you, Jesus, more profound. I want it to go deeper. And I want it to be transformative. I want it to be life-giving. That's the relationship I want with you, Jesus. That's a personal relationship. 
And then we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, wait a minute now. We have the dimension of space and time. What other dimension is there? Spirit. That's the dimension of going within. Do you know why the devil will use dispersion so much as an enemy to spiritual growth? Because in our tradition, spiritual growth is based on the principle of concentration. Not focus, but the coming together in a more dense way. If you want to weaken your spiritual life, spread you out. Remember? You'll be slow to act. You're going to go deeper in action if you can concentrate your energies and go within. Okay, going within. Let's go within to the deepest center of the deepest center of your being. That's your heart. And you know what you find in the depths of your heart? Your I, your I, your ego, your I, your personhood. Guess what the Holy Spirit is? Within your I. There's no place you can go within you without encountering the Holy Spirit, the presence of the third person of the Blessed Trinity. So let's get this right. You go outside of you and you encounter the transcendent Father who upholds all creation and you in it. You go through the day-to-day -day existence of your life and time and you encounter Christ at every moment who's there. Try to escape by going within and then you bump into the Spirit. You are caught. You are encompassed. You are surrounded by the presence of God that's personal and life-changing. <clears throat> the personal presence of the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who longs to reveal to you who He is as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. So much so that if you live your life in accord with the Holy Spirit, we're going to learn all about that, It'll be the Holy Spirit that moves you into action where you'll encounter Christ into the world where you'll encounter the Father. It's an exciting life. That sounds like many things. It doesn't sound dull. It doesn't sound boring. It doesn't sound like a burden. But that, this kind of threefold personal relationship with the persons of the Trinity is what we're called to. This isn't extraordinary. It's not just for the saints unless we realize we're all called to be saints, holy ones, because the holy one is within us. And this is our inheritance. This is our birthright. So that's why we're here. We're here to simply access what God has created us for. Do not live a life as Catholics, thinking that we are meant for less than an intimate, personal, profound, life-giving relationship with the Blessed Trinity. Okay? All right, let's close with prayer. And then just I want to give you guys a chance to share anything that struck you about what you heard from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you and praise you for the gift of our lives, the gift of our faith, the gift of this moment. And Lord, we ask for an intimate, personal, profound, and life-giving relationship with you, Father, with you, Son, with you, Holy Spirit. Please overwhelm us with your love. Please help remove the blockages to us coming into and receiving more uh, in, a, in, a, in a more real way who you are and who you want to be in our lives. I thank you for the gift of this night. Thank you for the gift of the riches of our faith and I pray that they would become more, uh, more real, more profoundly alive in each of us. And I make this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One last story. I meant to say this. Sister B, the cloistered nun, she told me a story about going on retreat. And the retreat master said, I want you to go and pray and come up with a one-word answer to this sentence. I am blank. One word. Come up with a one-word answer. I am blank. She went, she prayed, she come back. What's your answer? She said, I am known. I am known. And she brought up the fact that to know or to be known had to do with the intimacy of union, that she was known by God. That was how she saw herself in the eyes of God, a known. My God, who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
That's my prayer for you. Mm-hmm. That you'd be able to say, I am known. Thought it sometimes pretty good. Okay. <laughs> wow. So that's you say how do like how to to uh, cloistered religious have encounters with the bigness of God. Well, they do because they move away from the external world mm-hmm. and they're able to focus more deeply and go within themselves in order to go beyond themselves. And this actually ties back to what we talked about last week, silent, solitude, simplicity. Yes. Silent, solitude, simplicity is all about coming down our attachment and the desires that pull us into the external world in order to allow us to regather, to concentrate our spiritual energy, our, our focus, attention, etc., internally. Mm-hmm. Someone else, what struck you? What questions do you have? How do you relate that to our day and age of, it feels like we need to take so much action? Yep. Right yeah, so, okay, so we live in a time that focuses an awful lot on action, mm-hmm. right? Why? Action gets stuff done. But I, I mean, like, it seems that our culture is desperate for our action, too. You mean, like, oh, for the church to be active in the world? Totally. Yeah. So the question becomes, is the action we're taking in the world mm-hmm. just moving around the, uh, mm-hmm. the uh, mm-hmm. what do you call that thing? I, which I don't use very often, obviously. But <laughs> the vacuum cleaner, you right? It has to be plugged in. <laughs> it's got to be plugged in. So if we're going to go out in the world and be fruitful, be a fruit for his glory, we better be plugged in. So there, there used to be um, like a, more of a distinction between are you a contemplative order, are you an active order, going out and evangelizing. And the idea was that the contemplatives contemplate on behalf of those who are active. So we will be the fire in your engine, right? But then you had Ignatius say, we should be contemplatives in action. So let's root all of our action back into a time of contemplation. You look at Mother Teresa who said, when we're feeling busy, what do we do? Stop and go pray for an hour. Because otherwise, we're just going to be frenzied about more action, and it's not going to be traced back to the life-giving source of God's strength within. That's why, again, diversion, distraction, dispersion. You get up, get distracted, you miss your prayer time, and now you're trying to do God's work without God's power, and we run out, and it's only 8.30 in the morning. Ah, now we're empty. So next week, we're going to focus more on the concept of powerlessness. Okay? That part of God's call that we all like to avoid. 